being here. This is incredibly exciting to be here speaking for Open Source Bridge. Uh, I've been coming to OS Bridge for about two, three years now. I've been volunteering. This is my first time as a speaker. And this is probably a talk that's been in the works for two years, um, especially since crowdfunding has become such a big deal, especially for people who are doing projects or looking for funding for projects or who are a part of either volunteer organizations or just kind of any, any sort of uh, either capitally intensive or sort of uh, sustainable uh, project that you need you need either kind of some kind of funding for. Of course, my name is Skylar Corbett. I'm an artist designer and so on and so on. I can't exactly say that I'm a developer, even though that may be my job title for my day job. Uh, just keep that in mind that I'm probably, as far as the, the tech stuff goes, uh, I'm more of a tech historian and I'm more interested in the ways that technology is being used than my own ability to understand uh, whatever development processes you may be using. Of course, I'm from Portland. If you want to chat me or uh, hit me up after the talk, you can get me on Twitter, at Skyler, or you can reach me via email at skyler at skycorbett.com. Just in case you need to remember what my first name is. <laughs> so, crowdfunding. What is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding things. <laughs> crowdfunding things. Excellent. What is what is crowdfunding? This is. I just wanted to tell you that this is going to be kind of a participatory talk, um, not because I'm lazy, but because I definitely want to have a discussion after this. This is going to go pretty quick because I want to talk to you all of you about the projects that you're doing. So so what is crowdfunding? Anybody have any, what, what do you think crowdfunding is? Anybody? Okay. So the term has become associated with running a one-time campaign thing like a Kickstarter thing. Right. But in a big broad sense, it just means a lot of people instead of going for a big grant where you get like this one big donor for something. Right. So you go for lots of small people like Wikipedia donating. Or right. So instead of just say having like a grant from the government or borrowing lots of money from your mom, uh, which is how I got my first guitar, you, you instead go to all of your friends and your friends' friends to borrow money for that thing that you want, you know, like maybe the, the food truck that you want to start down the street or in the case of one of my friends' open source projects, um, which you'll see in a second, he went to a crowdfunding site to gather money to kind of fund his sprints for the time that he'd be taking away from work. So crowdfunding is it, it's kind of a loose term when you think about it, but you said you, you might have some I was just saying it's a re-democratization of capital investment. Re-democratization of capital investment, that's great because that's exactly what Kickstarter is. Kickstarter is really, um, I had this conversation with Aaron yesterday, uh, Kickstarter is really like the thing when you talk about capital investment. If you just want a one-time push, raise your hand if you don't know what Kickstarter is. See, so everybody in this room knows what Kickstarter is. Of course, it's a crowdfunding talk. You know, so Kickstarter, like philosophically, Kickstarter is great for that big, really fundraising push where you're gonna hit that, uh, the threshold, right? The, the threshold limit of uh, an influx of cash. You, you really just need that, that, that investment, and you need that investment to reach a certain limit, or, you know, uh, as you would say, mutually, you would walk away. The funders would walk away. The, the, the person who's looking for the investment would walk away. And so one of these people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the human element here. Um, I definitely owe this talk to my friend Desiree Stage. Desiree Stage, that's her and her rat, rather. Desiree Stage funded a project called Live Through This, which is for people who uh, have, you know, some, some very, like, um, how do I put it? They, they, they're dealing with, with suicidal ideation, suicidal feelings, suicidal thoughts and they just wanted a, a way to tell their story. And so her project was a lot like, um, has anybody seen, what is it, The Humans of New York? The Humans of New York project, where it's, you give a, in The Humans of New York, the photographer gave a photo and kind of an essay of the person's life. Desiree Stage, um, she did something very similar where she'd go to people who experienced what it's like to be on the other side of a suicide attempt, who survived a suicide attempt. And, she would take their photo and she'd sit down and she'd interview them for, for her website. And I definitely, if you want to 
find out more about this, I definitely encourage you to go to the link to this website. And so for her Kickstarter campaign, what she did was she was just looking for a lot of, just like a, a big upfront sort of investment from her community and from the people who were interested in her project so she could take her project and tour it around the United States, right? And so she had she had a goal of about, what is it, 20, yeah, oh, probably about over $15,000, I think was the, the initial goal. And she managed to stretch it to over $22,000, which was enough for her to go from Brooklyn, New York, which is where she's from, all the way to Los Angeles, up here in Portland. You know, basically she took this thing all the way around. And one of the things that Des recommended um, for it, in terms of Kickstarter is that it's really kind of a full-time job is when you're doing this sort of thing, especially since Kickstarter has that 90 day window, you start that 90 days looking at three months of your life going by, just relentlessly promoting your Kickstarter campaign. And that's, that's really what she did. She, she had a job at the time, she quit her job to devote her time to this, just so that she could make sure that her project was successful, so that for the rest of the year she could guarantee that live through this would be a success. So going for another story, this is my friend Aaron Shea. Aaron Shea is a musician up in Seattle, along with his friend Strangely, they had a goal of going to Iceland to go to the Icelandic, I think there was like some sort of a, like street festival sort of thing, like a French festival in Iceland. Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a capital investment platform. <laughs> this is my friend Aaron Shea. Aaron Shea was, um, was able to fund his Kickstarter campaign uh, through social networking. So a lot like what, what my friend Des did, reached out to, to his friends. He didn't really spend as much time as she did focusing on it, mostly because this was like a one-time deal, one-time trip. It wasn't really like... Um, you know, supplementing their career or his career as much as it was for Des. And so what they were able to do was they, they went around to different concerts and stuff. I watched them and they'd go and they'd pass out cards for Kickstarter. They'd promote it on, on you know, Twitter and on Facebook. And they were able to reach their goal. They went to Iceland. They played on a, a restaurant boat in the harbor of, uh, was it Reykjavik? They were able to play on a boat in Reykjavik where people were eating Italian food less than five feet away from them, which I thought was really cool. And so for, for Aaron, when I asked him what his experience for Kickstarter was, he said that it was great. Kickstarter was exactly what they needed for, for this specific project, for this specific trip. Um, they definitely hit that threshold, and when they hit that threshold, the people who were in their community that donated to their project, they were very happy with the fact that their friends were able to go to Iceland and experience this trip. Um, they were happy that they were supporting their artists. And for the artists themselves, they said that using Kickstarter was a piece of cake. Um, going back to Dez's project, speaking of Kickstarter, so Dez mentioned that Kickstarter, one of the advantages of Kickstarter is the uh, curation element of Kickstarter. So in Kickstarter, of course, you apply for a project in Kickstarter. If Kickstarter likes your project, they throw it up on the board. Des was able to promote her project to the point where she really rose up to the top. In the photography category of Kickstarter, she was pretty much in that like top 10, if not number one. And that really helped her campaign. So for Des, under the Kickstarter banner, she was able to attract people who weren't a part of her social circle or a part of her, her social network. Whereas when you look at at Aaron's campaign, when I asked Aaron, did Kickstarter do anything for your campaign, he said no. And that was because they weren't really even n near any of those leaderboards. So what you'll find with a lot of these sites that are like uh, curation sites, like Kickstarter, is that maybe if your project is popular enough, it will help you. But mostly not, not really. Um, you might get one or two people who are curious clickers that'll donate five or 10 bucks to your project. But for the most part, for something like Kickstarter, you're going to have the people who are a part of your social network or the wider grasp of your social circles donating to your project. Which leads me to Patreon. With my buddy Paul Fenwick, 
who wasn't going to be able to make it here to Owens Bridge this year. So this is a picture of Paul with his top hat. And Paul has been working on a modification for the uh, <laughs> Kerbal Space Program. I guess it's kind of a half game, half simulation for putting rockets in space. Awesome. It's awesome. That's cool, because I've been donating to his project, but I haven't even played the game. And that's actually how good social networking and how, how good crowdfunding can be, is that Paul is like, I really want to fund developing this comprehensive Kerbal ar archive network, which is basically, it's, it's a mod for all mods, right? It's the mod of all mods. It's, it's kind of like a, a list or a database for mods that will also update your mods if you have a list of mods for the, the Kerbal Space Program game. You really need to play I, I, As far as I know, this is what KSP is. <laughs> I just, that's. That is exactly what it is, also not exactly that's, what it is. That's, that's for Paul, because he always put cats in his thing, so. So there you go, Paul. So, so for, for Paul, I asked Paul how is Patreon working out for him, because he just launched his Patreon about, I think it was about two months ago. So I've, I've given him uh, two rounds of funding in Patreon so far. And Patreon's been going great for him. He's been able to clear out his schedule. So instead of looking for smaller projects or whatever that he would do on the weekends, he's cleared out his, like one weekend a month to do one intensive sprint working on the Comprehensive Kerbal Archive Network. And he has currently 60 patrons at $539 a month. He has some milestone goals. One of the milestone goals is for a thousand bucks a month. If he can get, if he can get, that'd probably be what, well over 150 patrons. If he could get a, a, over 150 patrons contributing a thousand bucks a month to his his project, he would clear out more than just one weekend, and he would focus on the comprehensive Kerbal Archive Network more intensively. And so for for Paul, Patreon's great because one, there isn't a threshold. It's pretty much whoever is able to give to his project on a monthly basis. Um, his thing, Patreon, if you're not familiar, actually, who doesn't know anything about Patreon? One person. So Patreon, Patreon, the way Patreon works is that you can either have a monthly donation or you can have a donation per object or thing that is produced. So if I'm making little handcrafted beads, every time I make a lot of handcrafted beads, that is a thing and the people who are backing me on Patreon will, will put in their donation and they'll be charged at the end of the month. So that's kind of the function of Patreon. So for, for Paul's thing, whenever he does a sprint, that is a donation from his group of, of backers. So 60 people will give Paul money every time he goes through a sprint, which is great because for the people who absolutely love Kerbal Space Program, whenever they get an update to CCAN, that just makes CCAN more awesome. So Patreon has a, a direct link to the product itself that is being produced which is <coughs> patreon.com, P-A-T. So everybody makes up spelling these days, so. <laughs> it, let's see, does it, does it even say? No, it doesn't even, there we go, there we go. Uh, that one. Yeah, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, so there you go. Which, which goes, my money goes to funding Space Cats. That's going to the um, kind of a more traditional fundraising model is uh, Indiegogo, the site Indiegogo, and my friend Joshua Tucker, who is an activist and a, that's Josh right there. He's an activist and a documentarian. Currently, he's in South America um, in, I believe, let's see, I think he's in Chile right now. He's in Chile and he's documenting a lot of the um, kind of hardships and atrocities that are happening in Chile. Uh, Josh had a documentary when he was up in Alaska working with the native tribes who were fighting uh, the pebble mine. And while he was working on this documentary, he just he needed funding for just regular everyday things, you know, like cards for his camera, the ability to take a flight somewhere. He just needed, in general, just you know, kind of a cash inflow. And this was, this was at a time when Patreon hadn't even really become popular. So his solution was going to Indiegogo. He, he ran several Indiegogo campaigns that were pretty successful. This is the last one. So obviously, it says 75 bucks, but I believe that he made more money than that over the, the lifetime of uh, him making this documentary. And through the Indiegogo site, that, that was his kind of funnel 
his ability to, to channel people to one place to donate was using Indiegogo as kind of like the last, the last step. So instead of pulling out a cell phone and having people run their credit cards, he'd have people go to the Indiegogo site and just, you know, whenever he was doing a push, he'd say, okay, I have a new Indiegogo campaign. You know, could you please contribute it? He pushed it on Facebook, he pushed it on Twitter. And it really helped him um, get through the, at least the, the first steps of his documentary. He's still working on completing it. But for, for Josh, Indiegogo, when I asked him how did Indiegogo work for him, he said, well, it was a lot like grassroots fundraising. It was like going around you know, asking people to kind of pitch in money into a hat. And so he didn't really ever have a goal. His goal was to be able to make it through the month Maybe Patreon would be good for him now. Maybe if he set it up like every time he makes an edit or every time he makes an appearance somewhere, people would, would fund him or just on a month to month basis. But since Patreon didn't exist, uh, Josh's solution was Indiegogo. Another solution, which is kind of the, the point of me being here at Open Source Bridge, is DIY. And for my example for DIY is. Uh, my friend Aaron Shea's musician friend, Kate McKnight, who's also in Seattle. That's a picture of Kate. And her, her artistic project, her band Dogwood, she funded uh, a project not too long ago just using a basic website and a PayPal link. That was her way of going through with it. She didn't want to use Kickstarter. She didn't want to use any of the, the crowdfunding sites. She just wanted a really simple way to to collect money from people, and she found that PayPal was a really effective way to do it. Um, one thing that, when I asked uh, Kate how did she like using PayPal, because I've never heard of anybody using that before. For, for me, I've only used PayPal for like uh, work projects sort of thing, like building websites or giving people uh, design material or that sort of thing. Kate said that it was great because one thing that PayPal provided her that I didn't realize was just kind of general information about people. So she'd get email addresses, that sort of thing. So she'd be able to reach out to people after her funding campaign and say, would you like to donate again or please come to my show? So she was able to kind of mine PayPal's data for uh, funding to you know, expand her social network or expand her email list. The other thing that Kate said that was great about it is that it felt really personal. So instead of sending people to Kickstarter, instead of sending people to Indiegogo or Patreon, she was really bringing people to her own site. She was able to track like, exactly how many people came to her site. And it was just really kind of like a one-to-one -one thing where she would tell them about her website. People would go to her website. They'd click on that PayPal contribute link. They'd shoot her money. You know, they'd donate to her cause. And after her, uh, her campaign was ended, she was able to send everybody the materials. And it was just really organic. Hold your question until the end real quick. This isn't going to take too long. So, so Kate's project, Dogwood, went really well, according to her. It, it really, it, using PayPal really helped her just because of the simplicity of it. The, the underside of that, though, the part that I, I would gather everybody here would be able to do is that she needed a web developer to do it. She needed somebody to build the web page. She needed somebody to you know, deal with PayPal, you know, presuming that she wasn't able to do it herself sort of thing. Um, somebody set it up for her. Somebody set up the account for her, linked it to the page. And she was able to process the requests for herself. But really, there's a lot of upfront work that you have to do to do DIY that doesn't necessarily happen with Kickstarter, Patreon, Indiegogo, and so on. So moving on to the topic of fees, and I want to preface that I'm referencing this from my friend Dez's talk about crowdfunding for mental health. Um, Dez did a lot of really good work when she was going around the country giving talks to people, telling them how they could do a project just like hers. And so she kind of put together this quick slide deck on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, GoFundMe, and Patreon as far as what are, what are the costs and what are the advantages of it. So looking at Kickstarter, of course, Kickstarter does the uh, curation model. You know, they don't allow charity fundraising. So if you have a cause or something, you can't just say, you know, hey, I'm going to go feed birds in the park for $500. That, that's not going to make it. Um, so the application process kind of equals quality control. I'm not so sure with the whole like mashed potato guy that thing that happened, right, on, on Reddit, you know, the guy that ended up with like a million dollars to make a thing of mashed potatoes. That was a potato salad? Thank you. Thank you, internet. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I mean, you chop some onions. Anyways, so Kickstarter, Kickstarter has fees. And correct me if I'm wrong, so is the, I believe the Kickstarter fees apply on top of the banking fees. Is that right? No, it's 5% no. for Kickstarter and then the banking fees. Right. Like 4% for it and everything so, so it breaks down 5% for Kickstarter, about 4% 4, 4 for banking fees. And so that, that's actually a lot of money at the end of it. And when, when Des went through Kickstarter, one of Des's main complaints is that, yes, she was able to raise a lot of donations. She was able to raise enough money to fund her trip, but at the end of it, after Kickstarter's cut and then after the banking fees, um, you, you could say that one leg of her trip, sorry, just one second, you could say that that one leg of her trip was effectively cut out because of the, the amount of money that was taken from her project sort of thing. So going into Patreon, the, the sort of hit that you're taking with Patreon is also a 9% fee. And so if you, what is it, if you get $100, Patreon gets $9. Right? If you get $1,000, Patreon takes $90. Well, if you, if you manage to have a Patreon like Amanda Palmer, where you're raising upwards of over $10,000, that fee ends up becoming a lot of money. So you, you, there's kind of like this balance between using Kickstarter and Patreon as like a funnel or as like this attractive sort of vetting thing. But on the other hand, you're looking at this, this kind of underside of it, which they're making money off of you, right? And it's kind of the same with Indiegogo. Indiegogo has fees between 3 and 14%. Um, it depends on if you're having a fixed campaign or a flexible campaign. In, in the case of my friend Josh, the documentarian, he had a flexible campaign, so he ended up taking the higher hit, which wasn't so great for him because he wasn't making enough from donations to really support his, like, both whatever travel expenses he had and whatever operational expenses he had. Um, he, he also didn't have the kind of success that Des had for, for her Kickstarter project. Uh, Indiegogo does give a break to uh, nonprofit organizations that are registered, 501c3 organizations. Um, if you're not a nonprofit, that's going to really hurt. I have no idea how those taxes work, but if, if you're taking in money, I presume that after you take the fees from these places, you're also going to pay taxes on it. And I think that's one of the things that Des said to me is that, so after Kickstarters, going back to Kickstarter, after going through Kickstarter, after Kickstarter's fee, after the banking fee, and then after paying taxes on the money that she raised, um, there was a good chunk that was taken out. So just kind of be aware of that when you're funding yourself from these sites is that you're going to have to do some kind of financial accounting based off of it. And kind of the same, looking at uh, GoFundMe, which is very popular with a lot of people that I've seen on Facebook who have you know, some sort of health issue or family crisis. Uh, GoFundMe seems to have become the place where it's like, I really, really want to get you know, a trip to Europe. Could you please give me some money? Um, so GoFundMe doesn't have any eligibility criteria for that. Uh, it could be used to raise money for nonprofits. So if you're a 501 C3, uh, GoFundMe is an option. Um, they have, just like Indiegogo, they have an option for all or nothing uh, fixed funding campaign. And their fees start at 6.75. They go up to 9.25. And charity funding apparently has the highest fee. So across the board, fees kind of tend to hover around the 9% range. So just kind of take that into account when you're doing your fundraising, because if you need that extra 100 bucks to pay somebody, uh, that might be essential. So going into st statistics, some of the statistics that my friend Des gave me off of her, her own Kickstarter account, when I asked her, you know, how, how much did Kickstarter benefit your campaign? And she said, a little, not a lot. One thing that Kickstarter gave her was kind of, it's kind of this kind of form of credibility in a way, because it's, it's a well-known site. So you got your site on Kickstarter. You have a Kickstarter. That's really cool. People are excited. They know what a Kickstarter is. You know, they know about you know, that if you don't get your threshold limit, you're not going to be funded. So there's all this kind of excitement and exclusivity. Um, and so she, she was able to track through the numbers how many people donated from uh, an external source who came from an external source like Facebook or Twitter. She was able to track that. And then how many people donated to her uh, cause through Kickstarter? And which, I mean, if you look at it, that's like, what, maybe 1%, maybe a little bit less. So 
Kickstarter does work, but that's only if you hit that, that popularity threshold as well. If Kickstarter pumps your page up to the top of its list, you might get some donations from Kickstarter. But on the whole, you're kind of on your own, really, working through your social networking, working through Facebook, working through Twitter. Those are going to be the majority of donations for the project that you're working on. And so going to the open source uh, solutions, if you're, how many people here are working on open source projects that are interested in funding that project? Awesome. Very cool. You are my people. So for, for open source projects, since those aren't exactly capitally intense projects, or depending on who you're talking to, um, I think there was one technologist that I just read the other day where it's like projects tend to expand to the budget that they're given sort of thing. Right? So if you're given $100,000, which would be amazing for an open source project, your open source project would also kind of expand to that $100,000. So I'm not sure how wise that would be based on what I said. Yeah, that would be, it would be pretty ridiculous. It would be bad, right? So instead, you might want to try something that's a little bit more pa like Patreon, where it's like you have a trickle, you, have, you know who your development team, you know, you know where the money's coming from and where the money's going. Um, one, one option that's available is Tilt Open. And did that, oh no! My screenshot of Tilt Open didn't, didn't render properly insufficient memory. So for Tilt Open, Tilt Open is kind of like a replacement of Kickstarter that, uh, what, it was started, what, two years ago? Was it two years ago? Yeah, so it started roughly about two years ago. It was just kind of like a build your own Kickstarter. So if you're interested in doing this yourself, I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, Tilt is now, uh, what, half a commercial product and half a free product. I haven't quite figured that part out yet, but I definitely encourage you checking it out. You know, in, so instead of building your own website and hooking up to PayPal, if you want something that's, that kind of already has the kind of Kickstarter e Patreon e modality, I definitely recommend Tilt. And then one, the, the person who I keep looking in, into the audience because he's more of an expert on this than I, is this is, this is Aaron's project, Snowdrift. That's, I think that's Aaron right there. All right, that's you. Yeah. So. Um, Snowdrift, it's not, it's not in development just yet, so this isn't going to help you right now, today, but support them, you know, check their, their site out. What they're trying to do is a different modality from the other modalities that we've been looking for. Oh, I see. I see where my tilt open slide went. So they're, they're, they're working on something that's more of a collective, like a, a collective more like, um, oh, I, have a, I don't really have a good word for it. Like, yeah, like a cooperative crowdfunding model. That's, there we go. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, it's like a, a cooperative crowdfunding model. So instead of Kickstarter where it's like one, one person on a person-by-person -person basis kicking in uh, funding until you reach your limit, or Patreon where it's a person-by-person -person basis where it's like people select their own individual contributions, they're kind of doing this, this kind of wide net uh, collaborative cooperative model where individual people set what their limit is and based on how many other people, is that right? based on how many other people decide to fund, that's what your donation is. So if, if that project extends to 10,000 people and you put in a cent, well then you're in for quite a lot of cents. So check out Snowdrift and support them. But if you want to build something today, right now, Tilt is probably going to be your best option. Um, you know, that's, that's their page. If you, go, if you go to the Tilt Open page, um, you can kind of figure out what it is that you need to build your own open source based, you know, self-hosted solution for, for crowdfunding. So, do, do, do. thank you. <laughs>